Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Zeiss Conversations. We've got a really excellent guest today uh, for you. He's a fine arts photographer of some renown, um, operates a gallery out in Las Vegas. We actually happened to meet him um, through one of our sales reps who said, you got to come see this guy. And boy, was Bob right. So without further ado, Mario Basner is sitting in with us in the center square. We are live at five here with uh, Zeiss Ambassadors Tracy Page to your left and Kenneth Hines to your right. Hello, everybody, and welcome, Mario. Hi, everyone. So, Mario, why don't you give us a little bit of background about how you came to photography, um, how you landed in Las Vegas, and, and, and how you approach your work? Oh, boy, that's a lot of questions all at once. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let me try to make it to you the short version. I was, I was a musician, actually a professional musician for 25 years, so the majority of my life. And um, I was uh, undergoing a transition into photography after doing a lot of print work, actually in the darkroom in Los Angeles for friends that were photographers that led, then led to doing uh, printing for some commercial labs and then having my own darkroom uh, eventually. And then starting to shoot and shoot more and more. And basically what happened is that the, the work I was exposed to uh, working for these these incredible photographers. This was Hollywood, you know, 15 years ago, people would walk in with incredible, incredible treasures, like original negatives from eight by 10 negatives from the 20s and 30s and uh, just incredible imagery and something just clicked. And it's, I was very attracted to the medium mm -hmm. um, and then spent a good decade to, to build skill and, and basically find myself at one point or another. And that point happened in 2013 uh, when, when I found a subject matter that really hit home with me. Um, and I did a documentary series essentially on an abandoned tuberculosis sanatorium in Germany, although I was living in Las Vegas at the time. Uh, and that's when it all came together with me. That's when I found uh, one thing that uh, is pretty tough to find, which is purpose and direction and, and a def very defined identity of, of what I had been felt I was missing for a long time. But I came to Las Vegas for other reasons for a and uh, like everybody comes to Las Vegas for a divorce and, and a job. <laughs> it's usually a combination of the two of them. So it was the same for me. I came here for music actually and ended up playing some a number of shows here. Uh, Vegas has been very, very great actually and I really fell in love with this city. And there's much more culture here than people actually think. I'm going to say that right now. <laughs> oh, I know it. I, I, and I, because we're there a lot for trade shows when, when uh, pre-pandemic. And I always make it a point of taking people outside for First Friday when the arts uh, studios are open downtown. Yeah. Or even just yeah. getting downtown. You know, you talk a lot of people about, you know, hey, have you seen such and such? And, and they don't leave the strip. And there's so much more vibrant neighborhoods in, around there. And yours Absolutely. being one of them, with, you know, with your studio that... that mm -hmm. That's actually behind you there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot happening in Las Vegas. There, there are great museums here. There is a great local art scene, the arts district. It keeps growing down in the downtown area. And things are starting to come up actually all over the city, which is something that I really like to see. And there's, there's a lot of movement. So in your intro, I see that art has been a big part of your life, essentially. You know, being a musician, you're a mm -hmm. photographer. You know, are you still, you know, in the musician uh, lifestyle and have you mixed no, the two at any? No, no, not really. I, I play a little bit here and there, um, mm -hmm. but my focus is certainly on, on, on uh, photography and, and art. Um, it's funny, you know, for those people that have seen the video, Tony, you're going to appreciate me saying this, uh, the video that Zeiss did for at the Morgan in New York City. The first line that I say in that video is, at, at which point does a, a photograph become art? At which point and, uh, does Initially, a when I first <laughs> received the first draft of that, it, was, it actually said something different that I said in the interview. And I had him take it out because I thought everybody would just think I'm crazy and I'm, I'd be mad at me. Because I said, I don't, th the question was something about well, how do you, you know, the art of photography and this and that. And uh, I, bas I basically said, I don't think photography is necessarily art. And that didn't come, and that requires an explanation, right? So it didn't come from a place of arrogance or, or, or anything of that nature. It, it came from having experiences of simply doing a job or doing something for a commercial purpose or something that's not intended to 
to wow someone's world necessarily or to to create an emotional or intellectual dialogue is simply meant to i don't know product photography for example you can do them very different ways you can do that as a product photo uh, photograph or you can do that in a way that resembles maybe a more of a classic painting where you just get lost in what you're seeing you know both those are different uh, approaches and different purposes so that's all that meant all I meant. No, and I, I would have taken it in a completely different direction because for me, I, I can make the same statement, but it was just because it took me so long to understand that my camera was an acceptable paintbrush because I was mm -hmm. a painter. Yep. Um, so I didn't think of photography as art because to me, my camera wasn't an acceptable paintbrush, but now mm -hmm. I'm finally in a position where my camera is an acceptable paintbrush. And I, I see you in the same place. I think we probably started about the same time, about 15 years ago. What uh, what instrument did you play, by the way? I was a drummer. One of those. And, <laughs> <laughs> one of those. I seem to know a few of those. It's kind of funny. It seems like uh, I, so many photographers, I think, do start musically or are musically inclined. And I, I think when we look at composition, so much of the way we see things compositionally is placed in music composition. Do you find that that's something that's true for you also? I think so, to a certain extent, yeah. Definitely. I think one, one component that was big for me is that, you know, I started playing music when I was six years old. And uh, so the, just this reality of an audience uh, that, that exists and that, you know, I've, something I fed off my whole life. I'm just always very aware how that people will react, have a reaction to something that I'm doing when I'm doing something like that. And it's the same with, with art. And this is what, what I always look for. It's I'm never, it's, I had to really learn to take the back seat. And that's, that's really when everything started to work, when I put myself second and put, actually took myself out of the equation and realized it's not about me. What I'm doing is not about me. It's about something that's bigger than me. And then in, uh, in the end, once you put it on the wall, it is about one thing and one thing only. And that's what uh, experience does that provide an audience with. You know, what happens when someone stands in front of that? And that's, that's what's important to me. That's really what drives me. And that's where I take my direction from. It's sharing experiences, essentially. One thing that I noticed that we all share in common here, um, as, as far as what you and Tracy have shared, is that we all actually started in a different medium. Photography was not our initial medium that we uh, originated in. And mm -hmm. I think that's, that's something important to, to kind of make uh, notice of, because I, especially for someone like me. I was originally someone that was into painting and, and drawing. That's where I originally started. And transferring that over into photography, you know, people don't really understand how our approach to photography is different than those who, they just pick up a camera and they don't really see the, the whole art or the whole vision as far as what we might see in every image that we take as opposed to just picking up a, a, a box and pushing a button and then that's it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more than just that. And hearing what you, you were sharing about your whole experiences and as a musician and as a photographer, it's not about taking this image or that image. It's about what do I see in that? What, what am I reading from that, that image? Or what, what is it about this specific scene that is so important that I'm captivated by it. And what do I want my viewers who, who see this to also get from this? And there's a little bit more thought process that's in there that I think a lot of people miss in photography these days. They, they're in the age of social media and Instagram, we're so quick to, you know, we just want to take a picture, throw it up online, get se several thousand likes. But what's the actual true meaning? What's the true story behind that image? And I think that's a lot that's really been lost um, over the last several years. Mm -hmm. And a, um, a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Gurr at the University of South Carolina Aiken did his uh, doctoral uh, dissertation on the relationship between mathematicians, artists, and musicians. And I think that we do see a lot of cross. And I, Kenneth, I know you are very um, math and science oriented also. So because um, I know we talked about your study of physics at some point. So I, I do think that there is a, a lot of cross there, but Mario, I'm curious too. I know you said that um, one of your first major projects was the sanatorium. What drove you to wanna to, to use that as your, as your subject? It's fair to say that it found me. You know, it's one of these stories where 
um, I saw a Facebook post actually, uh, it was a picture series, one of the 10 coolest abandoned places in the world, you know, one of those things. And I clicked on it and I saw uh, a couple of images from this location. And at that point I was, I just immediately knew that I had to go there. There was absolutely no uh, rhyme or reason behind it. There was no why the time I'd, and it took, it was a big effort to actually make this happen. Uh, it wasn't, it was closed off, close to the public. It was under lock and key. I needed permission. It took over six months of getting, getting rejected and rejected and rejected until eventually uh, through a little bit of perseverance, I was invited to come. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it just the desire just got stronger and stronger as more, more time went on. And but there was also absolutely no particular purpose assigned to it. It wasn't supposed to be hanging on a wall. It wasn't supposed to be in a gallery, let alone in a gallery. Um, it wasn't supposed to be for sale. None of it. You know, it was simply something I felt I needed to do for myself uh, because something attracted me to it very, very profoundly. And then when I got there, it was even more profound than I would have ever expected, and it literally defined my um, my purpose. And on that, in that moment, I found myself. Well, and we can see that too, because I, I know that um, that was one of the first pieces of yours that Tony exposed me to. And he, he basically called me one day and said, you know, hey, this guy's the sanatorium work. You got to, I'm really enthralled mm -hmm. by this. You got to see this. So it had, it impacted him. It impacted me. It definitely had that impact with your audience. It left us mm -hmm. with this feeling of, of, um, of, former grandeur and uh, mm -hmm. current distress. And um, we were talking about this a little bit earlier about the idea of um, capturing some of these things before you know, it's, they're allowed to completely disappear. And, and we have a re revisionist history where we completely forget about these, these structures and, the, and what they meant and, and how mm -hmm. they are interwoven into our history. So where did you go from, from there? So uh, how did you, you move on to the next subject? Well, there are a couple of a couple of steps in between. Uh, let me touch on those real quick. So I, I did this project, and it took about two and a half, almost three years, to complete all the the posts and just really digesting what had happened. And what had happened actually is then that I inadvertently put myself in service of something that I found profoundly important. Because it allowed me, the experience allowed me to re reconnect with my, my value system and and uh, have all of a sudden as an inspirational quality in my life that I did not have prior to that. So I decided to actually put it on exhibition in its entirety, not just five, but all 24, print them all, frame them all, figure out how to pay for the whole thing. Uh, this is also something that started with absolutely zero budget and turned into a six figure you know, realization in the end. And I put it into a room and just opened the doors and in hopes that people would like it and understand that there's a story being told and, and appreciate that story or take something from it. And it was uh, that it happened just like that. I opened this room actually behind me for six weeks as a six week exhibition. Uh, it is, I'm still here, it's now three and a half years later. Uh, it's been embraced by, by the community in Las Vegas and they come here and, and, and take a lot of time and have an have a emotional dialogue and intellectual dialogue and treat it like going to a museum actually. And that's extremely gratifying to see, extremely gratifying for me. I, I know you showed us one of the pieces on the wall that was 10 feet. So in this first exhibition, how big were the pieces that you printed and put up? What do you see behind me? They're still I mean, the what, same what is, is, is that one 10 feet also or? Um, this one over my shoulder is five by seven and a half feet large. And that's, then there's a, lo there's a lot of other ones that are 40 by 60 inches is kind of a standard size that's here. And then a couple of smaller ones, especially for the some more, some more detail, uh, detail shots and so forth. How much of a process was it for you to curate down to 24? Easy, easy, because I didn't have a huge catalog to begin with. I was quite deliberate when I, when I did this project and I basically worked the same way that I do now where, where I take a lot of time doing, doing one particular image and uh, having a reason for doing that, you know, so there's no, I'm not necessarily going through a catalog of 200 to find 10, you know, not at all. One thing that I noticed about your work and to kind of uh, dig a little deeper into that is in kind of going through and looking at some of the images that you you have, mm -hmm. I noticed that you you really appear to have a very intricate level of detail for every image that you take. And that's, that's something that's very noticeable. Mm -hmm. And especially for someone that does architecture, I 
I really admire your work in thank you. I noticed that your lines are just always so perfect in your thank images. You. Thank you. That's one thing that I see a lot of people who might be doing architecture um, online and I always notice that oh, this might be a great image, but your lines are off. And so how much time do you put into taking the photos that you do and kind of an, a little sub option of that, a sub question, uh, what gear do you use for the images that you take as well? I take a great deal of time for it. Actually, the, the, um, the George Peabody Library, Tony, if you could pull that up, is, is a really good example. That is uh, done with, uh, uh, it was done with the Nikon D810 and um, uh, Zeiss Milvers 18 millimeter. Um, on that one, I took a lot of time. I had, I mean, it's, I don't always get as much time as I like in these rooms. It's usually special permission when I go into a room like that and it's arranged months ahead of time. And so I'm a little bit reliant on, on in this case, weather to be, um, <laughs> to be on my side because there was a skylight. So mm -hmm. sunlight wouldn't have been good. It was a rainy day. And it, so it worked and I could have done what I, I could do what I, I came there to do. But it literally came, in this case, it came down to actually measuring, uh, precisely measuring to be an exact center. So measure from the ceiling to the uh, where I was standing and also on the sides to be exact center because other th otherwise lines will be off in a room like this. This is a very, very intricate one. Uh, if that's not perfect in position, you're, uh, you're not gonna get it. I love that you did this without a tilt shift lens. You did this by making sure the camera was positioned correctly, which is, yes. I think, a luxury that so many people don't think through. Well, it's, I go to that extent because I literally flew across the, the country to take that particular photograph. That's what mm -hmm. I came there for. So I have to give that the attention that, that it deserves. You know, it's, uh, it's costly to do that. And it's also not, that's, uh, not something that's readily available. I mean, if, you have, if I have the, the honor of being invited into these rooms, I have to respect that time and that occasion. And that's at least how I feel and what I try to do. And now has this opened up any um, commission pieces for you being able to do this? Actually, no. Actually, no. I might want to put my phone number right on the bottom. Here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> call, call Mario. He will come photograph your special library and buildings. <laughs> and do it beautifully. <laughs> Has there, been, art. has there been a, a specific <laughs> location that has just stood out as being your your all-time favorite so far and has kind of a special meaning to you that you've done? Um, actually, all of these places that I visit are so significant in what they have to say uh, that it's really quite humbling to be there to begin with. And then uh, it's very exciting to, to hang it on the wall in the end. And, you know, hopefully if I've done my job right, it's going to be something that will inspire other people. Um, the sanatorium will always have a special place because that's where it all started. That's where it all began. You know, it's, I, I think the, one of the toughest things for photographers or young photographers especially, or really any creative, to accomplish is to find our, our niche, you know, to find our, our thing, if you will. It's kind of a lame term, but it's, uh, it's how hard is it to find a direction that, def that defines who you are and leads you to a place that will leave you not only busy, uh, but only also fulfilled and happy at what you Sometimes doing. those are two different places. Those are two well, different niches. Be. Well, for me, they are. My bread and butter is is not the same thing that 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 fulfills my soul. So, um, I mean, photography for both. But and I'm lucky. I'm lucky to be able to pivot, starting to pivot from one to the other. But mm -hmm. uh, I don't think everyone is is that fortunate. I think some of us have to do the bread and butter things, but I, I'm hoping that um, everyone can find those things that define themselves as an artist. And it certainly mm. seems like you have. I consider myself really lucky, although I also have to say that it took me a really long time to get there. Uh, I was I think, 48 when I did this. Uh, so it took a while, you know, it took a while. Um, but, you know, I, I've done a, a class for the, for the um, Las Vegas Academy of the Arts last year. And it's that, and it really reminded me of, of where where our purpose might be hidden you know so we have to be open to it you know it's there were all these students and there was one in particular that uh that there's a, there's a great example for this it was a young girl she was a cancer survivor so she started taking pictures of other people in cancer treatment and that little black and whites was really compelling imagery 
And it's compelling imagery because it's close to her heart. It's something that is authentic. So, and I encourage her to, to dig a little bit deeper into that and do something with that. And it might lead her to be a journalist or to be an activist, to be a photojournalist, any of these things. But all of that comes from a place of personal uh, desire. So it will automatically lead her to the right place. That's, at, that's, least would, at least I would hope so. No, I, I love that you were able to identify that and, and guide her there. That's, um, and I, I think the emotional impact of what we do, I think you can definitely see that in our images. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're emotionally, um, if we have an emotional stake in it, then it comes across in our images. For me, mm -hmm. I know that um, my inability to remember, recall faces um, drives me to try to, um, you know, memory, my camera is my memory so that mm -hmm. I can, I can recall them later on, on, on film, on paper, on, on my computer. Um, so I think when we have that emotional stake, it really does, does cross over. So where else have you been, what are you currently working on? Where is this taking you? I'm working on a series of libraries. Uh, I'm, I'm expanding on that. A thematic I've visited last year I visited a number of uh, libraries while I was in Italy um, and I'm working on that material now. We had an excellent um, uh, visit when we first met Mario I, if you want to touch base on that one I know that a lot of the themes a lot of the challenges that you mentioned with the library in Baltimore <laughs> kind of mm -hmm. played themselves out in New York as well um, yeah. but the imagery that you were you were able to capture is just it's just fantastic and I I, 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 I take take my hat off my official hat off um, but I, I gotta say I, I was I was beside myself um, when I was actually able to stand in front of the image you know having seen the process all the way through I had an expectation of of what you could bring to the you know to the, the the printed piece the final piece but I was I I was wrong I was completely blown away by the emotion and the passion that you you'd put into the detail um, of the of the Morgan Library here in, in New York um, you know it, 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 tell us a little bit about that story as well uh, thank you first of all um, you actually, you just hit a key point, the, the emotion that goes into it, that's really all, my, the main factor of why my work looks the way you, it does, um, because it, it's an interpretation of, or recreation actually of emotion. So in other words, it, it's, it's where that particular location felt to me when I was there. Um, uh, it's not necessarily 100% accurate, you know, you were in the Morgan, the Morgan is a, a lot darker when you're in the room than it is in the image on the wall. However, uh, that's how I experienced it. And the, the way that it looks in, in the image now is basically shows me all the sort of the, and how glorious this environment is and how, how uh, exceptionally beautiful it is, you know, but it's not stuffy. If I would have made it darker, it would have a stuffy component. I didn't want the stuffy component because that's not how I perceived it. No, I think it's excellent. Thank you. Absolutely. It's, it's not stuffy at all. It's intricate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I get lost in the intricate details. Thank you. Thank you. It's the, it's the same for the, the images of the sanatorium. You know, a lot of these rooms were a little bit darker. Um, so they're everything, they're, they're all long exposures, basically. Um, but I saw a certain beauty there. And that's what I wanted to show. I, did, I didn't want to show dirt. I didn't want to show decay as the first, you know, um, first point of interest. There was an underlying beauty in these structures that I wanted to show. It's a, it's a story. It's a story, a story of humanitarian care, actually. If the more you get, you know, get knowledgeable of what, this, what, the, what happened there and how it happened and why, uh, it's really an inspiring story. And I wanted to show that beauty. And we have a question uh, from Brandon Cunningham. I'm very interested in the abandoned locations. Can you expand on the process you went through to get to uh, to to get the access? Boy, that's a story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it started very simple. I I, um, I became aware of the location. Uh, I was fascinated with it. I was very compelled to go. And really, right there, I, there was no no way I was going to take no for an answer. Basically, although that we don't always get that outcome, but I was uh, you know I was pretty firm. So I did some research. I reached out to the management company, basically that administered the facility. It was owned privately owned by an architect, and his firm uh, was dealing with everything. Uh, sent a, um, a letter or an email requesting access or permission to photograph it. I was denied. 
um, and then I sent three more. And that's, I think that there were a couple of phone calls as well to figure out well, why now, why, you know, why not me? <laughs> um, and basically at the time they were so inundated, they had been so inundated with requests that they, they did not grant any more photography requests across the board. So it was only for film, um, uh, the motion picture, uh, but not photography. They also had a lot of problems with people just not respecting where they are. So there was a lot of damage caused for people not, you know, which is always sad to see and it hurts everyone else, right? This is maybe also a good place to say that. If you're somewhere, you have to be respectful of where you are. You know? um, eventually, they got basically got tired of me calling and they said, look, here's, stop calling us. Here's the email for the owner. Email him. He does read his emails. Give it a try. Good luck. And I did that, and I thought this was my lucky day. And he also turned, said no, turned me down. But then we had a little bit of a dialogue and got to know each other. And eventually, he ended up inviting me. Um, and uh, yeah, and then actually, Tony, could you pull up the, the picture from Venice? The Doge? Uh, no, the one with the gentleman and me in front oh, of Oh, yeah, there. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there you go. So this is him. This is the owner uh, of the back then of this facility and this is actually a really great story because uh, so many things can happen when somebody just takes a chance and says yes you know takes a chance on something that feels right and in this case it did feel right to to both of us once he got to know me a little bit and we had a dialogue and he saw the the desire and the passion and the sort of the the seriousness of the inquiry it wasn't just a fun thing it was meaningful to me so he said okay uh, invite him he also knew that I was uh, in Germany at the time on tour as a musician with the Australian Bee Gees show from, from Las Vegas. So he just thought it was funny that here's this German guy who lives in Las Vegas who's going to be in Germany with this Australian Bee Gees tribute act and he wants to come by and take some pictures. It was just so weird. He just said, okay, let's just do this thing and go see the show. Uh, and then here we are in this picture six years later. Uh, when those very same photographs from that time ended up being displayed at the Venice Art Biennale in Italy. And it's one of the, it's became one of the highlight memories for him as well uh, from his time that he owned this facility and where the friendship emerged and something that he, he and I, neither of us are coming at the time. That, that's a great story. And one thing we get out of that, persistency pays off. <laughs> It does. It does. <laughs> it, it does. It does. And, 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 and I can relate to uh, how tenacious you are and also how haunting ideas are because, I mean, some of my images have taken a year and a half to two years to come to fruition. So mm -hmm. um, it's just that once we get them in our head, it's so hard to explain this to people. But once we get them out of in our head, it, it almost it's a journey that haunts us mm -hmm. and um and and just it it invades a lot of our thought processes and we we can't we almost can't proceed with other things until we until we get these things out of our head and into our camera or on paper it's it's um it's an interesting it is consuming that's that's tony i needed that word earlier can you remember that word <laughs> consuming. <laughs> consuming consuming we want the word consuming um eileen is on and we we, we absolutely love eileen kenneth introduced me to her and i just i am fascinated um and she was asking about how long those exposures are um oh boy um i'm actually not sure i know um I would have to look that up, but they're usually around between 30 seconds and a minute 15 around there. So it was, what? you know, not as long as it takes Kenneth to get a waterfall. <laughs> hey, thank, thank you, Tracy. For that. I'm just <laughs> kidding. You're trying to slow down the motion on the water. He's just trying, he's trying to capture the light. See, it's a totally mm -hmm. different usage. Mm -hmm. See, this is what I get from being for being out of town and coming back to to, to this. This this <laughs> is what it I endure. Anyway. <laughs> it just you endure this anyway. It's just part of of friendship here. We we yeah. we, we give each other hell. It's a mutual hell. <laughs> so in, in, you, in your in your long exposures, you know, with, as far as what you're photographing, what scene it is, mm -hmm. uh, is it based on like the 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 lighting conditions that you have at that time? As far as how long or short yes. the exposure is going to be? Yes, okay. yes, yes. It's always existing light, uh, existing light only. 
Um, so it's it's just determined by that, you know. Obviously, high ISO always. Yeah, I would say when we were in the in the, I don't I don't think I have good video of it, but when we were in the in the in the the Morgan. Morgan, yeah, it was it was really dark. <laughs> like, yeah. I kept asking myself, I, you know, not, not being of that caliber, I was like, I, I have no idea how he's going to get this imagery because it was it was so dark. Um, but yeah, no, what you were able to pull yeah, those out. Those were long. Yeah. Yeah, those were quite long. Those were exposures were quite long. Yeah, I, I well, want to say they were like a minute and a half. I think. Yeah. yeah. yeah I'm sure it's probably right. a challenge for Eden too to have enough lighting to light him without infecting his lighting for the image well she she was a little sneaky she um she used the the older super speed glass which is like a f13 so there ah. and shot it suit and just shot it wide open um so that's yeah she that was that was her trick for the darkness <laughs> but, wow eden and alexa are good at that they yeah. can i think they can capture anything so that definitely is something that you in the line of work that you do lighting well it, Photography in general, lighting is a very important aspect to have an understanding and a mastery of. Mm -hmm. And because of what you're doing and, and capturing that that natural ambiance of where you are, I definitely would would believe that your level as far as what you do and, and taking advantage of the lighting conditions that you have is so critical mm -hmm. to capturing what you see there, how things are and that resonating on on camera through the camera yeah the lighting the, the lighting sets the mood you know the especially when you look at interiors um it's it's the lighting or the current you know current conditions of the time of day perhaps um in a room that is that has windows like this one behind me that has all kinds of things going on it's the, the that's predetermined it's already there and that's what's the what's so attractive about it when when you're there you're you know you're affected by it and intrigued by it, so now it comes time to capture it. Well, so I, uh, I don't really like to shape things um, if they are already intriguing. But Tony, are you, showing, are you still? Um, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, go ahead, Tracy. No, are you still shooting on Nikon? I'm just curious. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. And and you were saying earlier you use the Otis lenses. Are you which Nikon are you using? I'm using the still using the D810. Actually, I'm thinking about an 850. I uh, I have the 850, and mm -hmm. I adore it so i would definitely uh, the dynamic exposure is the range is even even greater than the 810 so i think you would really enjoy that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm not you know i'm not a, not a big gearhead necessarily so i don't always get the newest and the latest right away uh the 810 has been been doing great things for, for me so i'm pretty happy with it still uh, you know i got i got the 850 when i had to duct tape my 810 together so i understand that point <laughs> <laughs> well i don't use my camera as much as you do so it's <laughs> It's pretty pristine still. <laughs> <laughs> and I use Otis, Otis lenses primarily uh, whenever I can. Uh, and if oh. I need to go wider, I use the Milvus lenses. Oh, the, the, I'm sure that's music to Tracy's ears here in that. I, Otis I'm music. the Otis shooter in the group, so. <laughs> oh my God, I, if you, if you I, I don't know if you print or how much you print, but for the type of thing that I do, when you actually go and get into some serious printing, high-end printing, um, it's it, it's it's just incredible what these oldest lenses can do. The amount of detail, um, it's, it's just mind blowing. Yes, Unreal. for me it's the way because I shoot with a one hundred. I'm mostly portraits, and it's the uh, the way that it uh, holds skin. Mm -hmm. um, the the skin and and other lenses just seems like it falls apart. But with the Otis, mm -hmm. it just is perfect. It, it's easy to edit, and it 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 just uh, really captures the quality. I think probably more like medium format than what else we can get from a DSLR or a Absolutely. mirrorless. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. Tracy it's, got it's me into the, she definitely got me onto the Otis lenses as well. So I have two questions. One is a question that I have as far as like the image that's behind you off your shoulder. Mm -hmm. In taking an image like that, do you do any um, uh, bracketing for the to capture the detail where you might have the, the highlights a little bit higher than your shadows. I do. And then also, what is your typical kind of f-stop that you're usually around for the images that you take as well? Um, I try to stay in the center of the lens, basically, for sharpness, for best sharpness. Um, sometimes it's not possible, you know, but I'm also, <laughs> not, I'm also not too big on everything being in perfect focus. It's not a necessity to me. 
uh, when it comes to this type, this type of imagery, to me, the, the, the technical aspect, meaning sharpness, does not have to be perfect all across the board. But the emotional aspect has to be perfect. You know, it's again the difference between you know craft and art. Like, how, what what happens? What's important? Right. So the the emotion has to be uh, on point. Um, if something is not quite, uh, it's maybe a little soft in the corner. Uh, I don't I don't really have a problem with it. In, in fact, sometimes I like it because it just stimulates the eye even more. You know, to to start interpreting things. I think that was a very important uh, point that you had there. That you know, I think especially in this day and age, many people are looking for the, the sharpest lens possible. They want the sharpest image that they can possibly get. And in what you're saying, it's, you know, the emotion comes first for you to where it, it doesn't have to always be a perfectly sharp image. And I think that's very important and something that a lot of photographers kind of lose focus of. And it's... it's it, it's mm -hmm. a different approach. I think it's a different approach, right? And, and I think it takes maybe a little bit uh, maturity and, and uh, you know, being secure with yourself to, to be okay with that and not, not be threatened by, oh, somebody could criticize this on, on my work. Um, so uh, some of the greatest images I've ever seen are far from perfect. In, in fact, they're perfectly imperfect. You know, they're <laughs> wonderful because something is, there's motion blur or something, you know, particular for like fashion, some fashion things. Uh, something like that. It's, it's just absolutely fascinating because it's a moment, and the moment is always what's what's important. Nothing else. It's really. And know, in fact, that that may be part of what I like about the Otis lens, because I, mean, I think the Milvis may be slightly sharper, um, but the Otis has more of a distinct look, and that mm -hmm. that sharpness to lack of sharpness, I think, gives gives our work a little bit of an edge. I don't know if you saw our marketing director's face um, up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I tend to keep myself off camera for for those reactions, but uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Oh no, it's it's you know it's everybody sees something different, and 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 you choose the tools appropriately. I mean, you know, yes. and I always say that to people. You know, it, if 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 you need an Otis, if if you find that you know that that Otis is working, great. Um, but it, you know, if you find that a 1940s lens that that somebody you know uh, had in a back drawer, you know, and it, it's delightfully messy, shall we say, when it when it presents you the image. I mean, that can be fantastic as well. It's really the way that you see the image and how you how you do how you put what yourself within the frame. I and, like, I and I don't mean to say that it's delightfully mm -hmm. messy. I think what I'm saying is that there is. Um, there is such a distinct style that the Otis brings oh, out yeah. where the Milvis just is neutral. It's, it's extremely sharp. It's extremely color neutral yeah. with the Otis. I feel like you, you build on it by adding this distinct look that I cannot duplicate in another lens. No. And, and, and to the, to your point, I've, I've seen what you've been able to pull out of that lens and, and it's, it's fantastic. You know, the, you've really, Tracy, been able to master the, the focus roll off so that I, and I even see you do it. You put the person's face in a specific, in a specific focal plane and allow the roll off to happen where you choose. And it's not always the same. And it's really kind of interesting how you choose to compose um, those fine details within that imagery. Um, and but the lenses can... you choose are fantastic for that. And I can see that crossing into to what Maria was talking about with the emotion, you know, your focus is where your where your emotional focus is. Right. And the softness can it can be welcome a little bit because it keeps your emotion exactly where you want it. Right. Um, where if everything were sharp, you would not you would not know where to, to focus on, where to concentrate on, where to start on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, it really I just, depends on the scene. It really depends on the scene. If you have something like a library with, with such intricate detail, uh, it needs to be shot. It needs to be in focus. Right. Uh, I, but if I, you have, go ahead, Tony. I was just going to say, I, I put, you sent me an image that I, I have up on the screen of the, the escalator. Um, mm -hmm. And I, mm -hmm. I had to stare at that for, you know, almost an hour just to try and figure out what the heck I was looking at because the, the abstract nature of the way that you position the shot, it, it mm -hmm. really, you, you, you know, it could it it could be a number of different th images that we're looking at, but it's it's just it was fantastic to me. I love this piece. Look, that's, Kenneth, that's he's he's made there. waterfalls out of the stairs like you do. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that's true. That you know, I have not done, I have not experimented with that yet. That that would be something I have to keep in mind. 
uh, one thing that I, I noticed between all of us is that we are manual lens uh, shooters. Mm -hmm. And so for the work that you do, have you always been utilizing manual lenses uh, like no. prior to the Otis lenses? Were you using a different uh, autofocus? Uh, or yeah, the the um, the sanatorium project was was really the first thing that I, I did that fell into the fine art domain, I guess. Uh, was not manual lenses. It was Nikon lenses, an array of different ones um, that are basically primarily rented for the most part, except for a couple that I owned at the time. Um, and then later on, I'd, I found myself renting nervous lenses all the time. And then uh, eventually grew up and got autos lenses. <laughs> this, I mean, there is something about it. Once you've, once you've gone there, it's hard to go backwards. It's just, it's really hard to, once you've shot with the Otis, it's really hard to step back and shoot with something else. I, I, my most expensive lens prior to Otis is sitting in a drawer for four years. It's just, you know, what it gives me is a great sense of uh, realism, actually. That's what's, that's for some people would say sharpness. For me, it's not so much sharpness. It's a, my, my prints especially have a lot of a great sense of realism and depth. And the, the orders really helps with, with uh, how that feels, you know, and how it's very natural and, and inviting and just perfectly balanced all across the board. It's gorgeous, so prints. Brandon has a question that I want to bring back up and I'm waving to Brandon because he's one of my best buds. So I'm glad to see him on. Um, he was asking about, are you, who's printing your work? And I know we talked about earlier how you started um, as kind of a, a print person doing the printing for other people. So are mm -hmm. you printing your own work or are you, or is somebody else doing this for you? No, I used to, I used to print in a dark room in a chemical, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's black and white. Uh, that's uh, some time ago now. Uh, no, my work gets printed in, in Las Vegas at Nevada Art Printers. It's an art reproduction service in Las Vegas, which is very, very good. It's pretty hands-on, though. The Robert, the owner, and I, we usually work together uh, and, and get, get optimizing for, for print and spend, spending time. So I don't, just send, I... I don't just send in a file and you know, hope, it, hope it comes back good. Uh, there's a lot of hands-on work that happens. I, I do that when I do fine art prints with Jonathan uh, Penny up in New York. He's very mm -hmm. hands-on with me. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I really understand really appreciate it. It's great. It's great to be able to do things locally for that reason. It, and, and, and it is. And it's great to have that relationship. Mm -hmm. um, Jonathan and I sometimes will we'll pick up the phone and just talk for an hour mm -hmm. and see where mm -hmm. that conversation kind of, kind of leads us to how we want to treat something. And um, those, those relationships, when you find them, are rare and should be treasured. I, that, that's mm -hmm. how I feel about that. Absolutely. Another benefit for me is that we're, I'm not sending files uh, um, through an uploading you know, server, um, taking in a stick. So we're printing a very, very large file. We're printing of sometimes three gigabyte files. And you can see that. Yes, okay. you, you can. Well, you're printing them very large, so they have to be and yeah. I mean, I think even if I hightail files to Jonathan, two gigabytes is the largest I can hightail. Mm -hmm. So I, I do understand that. And the, the imagery is, is just beautiful. The detail is beautiful. And I, we talked earlier on, on whether or not you should like pick up your device and, and walk around, but I really do want everyone to understand the scale of the images. Maybe we could do that. Okay, sure. We can Let me just unplug this thing here. It's, it's so hard to understand the scale when you see them over, over Mario's shoulder, but when he actually pulls you up to an image, it's, an, it's a completely different experience. And now, of course, I'm, I need a reason to go to Las Vegas so I can see them in person. Please do, please do. While he's doing that, you know, I, I also want you to touch on, you know, how, how important is it for a photographer to have their work printed as opposed to in this digital age, people just look to having their image upload it to Instagram or Facebook where it's completely compressed and, and you don't really have that, that true detailed photo that you originally took being displayed to the public. You know, how, how important um, is it to, for, for a photographer to have their work printed? In my view, it is extremely important. And if it's, in, if it's I mean, my, obviously I have a gallery, so there's a reason why these, uh, these pieces are on the wall here. Um, the, the same reason, though, applies when, when it's something that it's not maybe meant to be sold in a frame, or maybe it's just a memory uh, for a photographer, but it, it's a moment in time, and it's something that's going to inspire that photographer. He has it in his kitchen on the, on the wall. You know, if it's not there, 
then it becomes a commodity that's you know along with everything else these days you know it's very very fast moving uh consu- you know it's everything is getting consumed and spit out and the next the next next five two seconds later it's uh, what i do is certainly certainly different uh, i invite people to take a moment and engage with something and it's i think you know it's one thing i would actually like before i get up i want to just kind of throw out here is um what we talked about earlier a little bit uh which is finding purpose i think it's the i've heard people say oh i'm worried about the the future of photography i'm worried about you know the technology getting so so good that I've, how long are going photographers going to be relevant you know what can people do with an iphone 10 years from now they're not getting any worse that's for sure so where's the where's purpose where's where's the validity of what we do and i think it is very much in all the emotional co- components and in realizing that photography is not only very powerful but it's also very important there's a a, a german word that's called site document which basically means uh, it's a it's a preservation and documentation of a moment in time it has value it has value and it's actually very important to that that continues and the, the our benefit as photographers is that we have a the skill but also the experience to recognize those moments when they're in front of us and to preserve them in a way that they deserve to be preserved and that can be all kinds of different things that can be a you know big expensive piece on a museum or it can be uh you know a family portrait that is very important for that family right there's an importance to these things and if, as long as we respect those i think we're going to be in okay shape uh which then there's a lot of talking sorry that but that also leads me to why i did why i did this to begin with this uh was this was a little bit of a risk to open a gallery like this and the main reason i did it was to tell a story and there was it's because that story was important to me and i was okay with uh I, would, i didn't want it to fail but if it would have failed i would have been okay with that because i felt it was the best thing that i had ever done as a person for me uh from sort of heartfelt perspective and i thought it was uh simply something that a story that deserved to be told um so this is what we did there's now 24 pieces in this gallery i'm not going to walk through all of them we don't have that much time but there are a number of corridors and different things so this one the, the sizes of your prints how what are the typical sizes that you have in your gallery most of them are i'm going to unplug so if you want one is five by seven and a half feet and you have a i'm six foot four pretty tall guy so this could be a good idea of scale wow that's a beautiful image it just it just it, it, it as tracy was saying you know you don't really get the scale by seeing that photo being shown over your shoulder way. right exactly yeah or it, when tony right. pulls it up on the screen for us to see on the screen we can see the detail but we can't see this the impact of the scale well wow. then this That's this is 40 by this is 40 by 60 inches this is actually the first one of them all that got printed it's the first one i completed and this also happens to be the room where my life changed literally through the coming through this door um wow. which, is, which is something this is 30 by 45 inches And again, is that the sanatorium? Yeah, all of these, all of these. It goes around here. So there's quite a bit. This is 30 by 45 inches. Beautiful photos. Thank you. This is 40 by 60 inches. And I think that's one of my favorites. Thank you. That's 40 by 60 inches. So they're quite large. And then I know you want me to go to the library. <laughs> I just my wife, yeah. My wife just got in the picture and she loves it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this one I'm going to that is my favorite. I love that. So this is the Morgan Library, correct? No, this is the uh, George Peabody Library in Baltimore. The Pe- okay, the Peabody Library, the the Baltimore shot. Why this is the print itself is 60 by 107. Wow. So that's a uh, pretty big. Wow. Yes. <laughs> And it's it's beautiful. It is just beautiful. 
Now, we, 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 we see these pictures being shown here, but if people are in the area, where can they come to see your gallery? Because I in think person. people have to see this in person. <laughs> you should definitely come. Uh, While well, the gallery is at a uh, mall called Tivoli Village, it's the center in the Summerlin area of Las Vegas. Um, it's a very nice center with great dining and all those sort of options. Great coffee shop right next door. So it's a really nice place to come to. Sorry, sit here myself here again. Uh, it's a great place to come to. Uh, lots to see here and this gallery is, is quite big. There's a lot here, obviously. So yeah, I would welcome you, absolutely. Yeah, that's a, you are now on my bucket list. So um, <laughs> the next WPPI, we are allowed to attend in person. <laughs> mm -hmm. You were definitely on my bucket list. This is just amazing work. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure our community has enjoyed, you know, seeing your work and, and hearing from you, which I, I do hope that people are, are take what you've shared and really marinate on it and, and think about the, the emotion that you put into your images, the, the intricate level of detail that that you you take each project that you do and every single image that you do to like how you said, you don't take 200, 300 images. It's very specific as far as what you do. And I think that kind of level of precision, it's something that is admirable about what you do. And, you know, I, I'm, so delighted that I was able to, to be here, even though I'm out of town. And and uh, I'm, I'm kind of like the guest host to myself today. <laughs> <laughs> so Tony, you you said earlier that there was a, another project of Mario's that we wanted to talk about to bring up. Yes. Um, uh, we, uh, we, I, we touched on it a little bit. Uh, the, the, you, you, you were um, part of the Venice Biennale this past year. That's right, yeah. Yeah, which was incredible. I uh, was part of a, um, a collateral exhibition that was called Personal Structures uh, from the European Cultural Center. And it was, uh, it was an amazing, amazing experience. It's, uh, you know, to be invited and, and actually get to do that and go there. And um, it's, it's really the world stage, you know, that's the most uh, important exhibition in the world, really. And the whole city is just being taken over by art. And the great thing is that there's nothing else that's going to unlike, unlike what we experience here a lot, unless we're in a, you know, going to a museum museum. It says nothing for sale. It literally is about communicating and experiencing art and uh, uh, discussing it. And, and it's a pretty awesome environment, for sure. It that's sounds great. amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Goals. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, plus, I got to go to Venice last year. So oh. that's that didn't that didn't help. I <laughs> think I had already beautiful, followed beautiful. you on on social media at that point, so I got to see the uh, I, I got to see the posts that you made, which were pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank so, you. And and anybody looking to uh, follow Mario on social media, it's it's just Mario Bosner, correct? Or yes. Is there... yes. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah, and, and all that is, information's uh, on the on the YouTube uh, page for this video, which will be archived on our site. And he is very active on Instagram, so I get to see a lot of his beautiful work on Instagram. And I think we are now friends on Facebook too. So yeah, that's true. that's been pretty cool. I feel like through Zeiss, I have gotten to know all kinds of artists. Um, it's just just been such an um, amazing journey. I know Eileen Chaval is watching us too, and Eileen is an amazing artist and. Um, you know, thank you for being a part of our experience and, and let us tap into you today. Oh, absolutely. I'm, so, I'm very happy to be here. And, and there is also the uh, the Zeiss video on YouTube for anybody that wants to, to know any more about Mario. And there's a video on me on YouTube too. And right now I'm tracking slightly ahead of Mario. So if, if you watch <laughs> Mario's, you have to also watch mine and keep me there. So I'm just kidding. Go watch Mario's, go watch the uh, information on Mario. It's beautifully yeah. done by um, Eden Martinez and DP mm -hmm. by Alexa Wolf. And they did, they did such a beautiful, beautiful job of telling your story. They did, they did. Absolutely. Yes, they did. Well, Mario, yes. thank you for being part of our conversation today. I, I always love it when we can talk about just just what's behind the you know the the artistry that you bring to the screen. Um, so thank you thank for you. that, and uh, and and of course taking us around and talking a little bit about about your methodology and and the way that you perceive 
um, what you put on the screen. Thank you for that. Um, Tracy and Ken, as always, thanks for being a part of the conversation. Um, we have glad to have everybody here. We appreciate it. And thanks to everybody else who's been watching online as well. We certainly appreciate having all of you here and, and participating with us. And we're going to bring you a lot more information um, as the weeks come out. A special note in case anybody's thinking about next week. Um, we have a special event planned um, and the timing is going to change. It's going to be 10 a.m. Eastern uh, because we're going to have a guest uh, from our our, our, our German um, home organization in Oberkoken. Um, next week we have a, a special a special conversation about Carl Zeiss and the history of the company on the anniversary of his birth. So if you want to get up early and watch with us, or if you want to just wait for the archive, uh, either way, it's going to be a special week next week. So we invite you all to share with us. Until then, thanks everybody for hanging in there. We love having you here. Thanks to our team and to Mario, uh, and we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye now.